welcome independent researchers, skeptics, and all of humankind, shadow citizen. Shadow citizen will explore the shadows of an alternate reality. Your hosts, Rachel L. McIntosh and Rob Bostel. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. But I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, take another one and slam it into the Pentagon. Yes, <laughs> I'm afraid somebody did know that. And hey, everybody, thank you for joining in tonight to Shadow Citizen. I'm Rachel L. McIntosh, your host. And my co-host is Rob O'Sell. Rob, are you here? Hello, Rachel. And we have a great guest tonight. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, yeah, she's me too. She's a whistleblower like yourself. And you know, I'm really proud to uh, be associated with some of the smartest women on the planet. I, you know, So thank you for letting <laughs> me do this, really. Wow, what a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, our guest, everybody, that she just heard her, her name is Susan Lindauer. And she was a U.S. intelligent asset. And for people that don't know what an asset is, it's basically somebody who's kind of like a spy. Yeah, <laughs> kind of like a spy. And, like but, <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm sure Susan could tell us exactly more about that. But she ended up in jail because she did know that these planes were going to hit a building. And she's here tonight to talk to us. So, Susan, introduce yourself. Say hi to everybody. Hey there, everybody. An asset is human intelligence. So much intelligence these days is based on surveillance of phone records and metadata collection. But real intelligence, old-fashioned gumshoe intelligence, is human intelligence, where you're actually engaged in direct contact uh, with uh, a with the target and it's it's often very 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 dangerous one of my best sources uh who i might share with you if she's willing to do it um had someone inside the benghazi compound when senator when uh, ambassador stevens was taken that's an asset Except mm -hmm. she's a foreigner, so she would be an agent. But an asset is your own nationality. And we're seeing a, a ratcheting up of, like, the world is going crazy right now yeah. at so many levels. This, the, the timing of this interview, almost 9-11 is, 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 uh, you know, th th we're beyond false flags now. Thank Let's you. Let's put yeah. it that way. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, yeah, the this what do they call it? The uh, strategy of heightened tension is that uh, something that you go into quite a bit? I know that is exactly what's happening. But unfortunately, the heightened tension is feeding into hysterics. And in I'm in in the Washington D.C. area, area and they've lost any perspective. They're so afraid. They there, there's a you know as you know. Both a deep love and a deep hatred of Trump. You either you either love the guy or you hate him. Uh, I'm actually a Trump supporter. I think that America needs Trump to succeed. I believe very strongly that Trump has got to succeed, or we are in a world of hurt. China apparently contacted a a law firm called Wilmer Hale. And demanded, after this uh, special prosecutor was appointed, demanded that four, four Wilmer Hale attorneys should be released to contribute to the special prosecutor investigation because, in order to make sure that Trump, uh, because they have a close historical ties to Trump, and they add, and, and China initiated this. This is something that the, that, uh, anonymous, uh, the Julian Assange Anonymous group, the the hacktivist group, re revealed that they had they had captured the cables. So we have, you know, so they they had captured the cables from China to Wilmer Hale, saying, "For God's sakes, you have to stop this thing." China is terrified right now that if Trump is overthrown in a coup, and it's a coup, this impeachment nonsense is we're going to talk about everything. 
is totally garbage. But if, if Trump is overthrown in a coup, it would be a fast track to World War III between Russia and China and Iran. And so they are, they realize for all of you who think that Trump is like this misogynist, racist warmonger. In fact, Trump is anti-intervention. He wants America first, jobs first, trade first. What is wrong with that? I just cannot understand why anybody would be against that. And you have the warmongers who are the, the you know, the, the, the neocon Jeb Bush, George Bush, Dick Cheney cabal who are pushing war, 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 John McCain, war, 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 every opportunity that they can. And well, then well, we have the refugee crisis and, and this the schizophrenia of these people, the George Soros crowd, the millennial supporters saying, we want to protect the refugees, but we support Hillary Clinton and the neoliberals and the neocons who are pushing the wars. And there's no, there's, there's no, there's like the schizophrenia now. It really is dangerous. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Rob was going to ask something. I have a question about something you just said, but go ahead, Rob. You ask first. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, where the, the main reason we want to get into this is we want to talk, you know, something about, uh, 9-11 and, you know, and, and just recently there was this Manchester thing and I actually heard something news. Uh, interesting hit the news cycle, and this is a very short clip, but I'm going to just do it quick, and then let's talk about 9-11 and other false flags. What do you enjoy sure. report right there from Manchester? Listen to this. Um, and there is, in, it, it would appear, some evidence that this was a suicide bombing. Um, that certainly takes me down the Islamist terrorist um, direction. It must also be noted that in, in recent months uh, in Europe, there have been a number of false flag uh, plots where uh, right-wing extremists have tried to frame Islamists uh, for, uh, 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 for terrorism. So what he's saying there is, is, you know, that, well, the definition of a false flag, do you, do you want to do that, Linda, or I, or I can do it, or Susan, excuse me. Uh, or yeah, I go, can, go ahead, go for it. Well, it starts, you know, allegedly with, you know, pirate ships when they're, uh, they wanted to, you know, raid a, a, a ship that they saw out at sea, they would fly the same flag as the, as the ship that they, that they were approaching. And then, uh, once they got close enough, then they could, you know, board the ship and attack it. But, you know, by flying that false flag, the, the newer definition. Oh, that is a, that, is, I had forgotten that. That is actually a very good story. That is a very good definition of what a false flag is. You make it look like you, you're, it is an impersonation. That is exactly what it is. It's an impersonation to make it look like you are the, the enemy who you are trying to blame for the attack. Yes. And so Hitler's uh, Reichstag fire is, you know, is one of these famous ones, you know, that uh, they burnt down their own Reichstag and uh, and blamed it on Poland and in order to attack Poland. And there's, you know, there's a whole I'm not a great historian, but, you know, the the one that we've all lived through, the one anybody that's, you know, 20 years old now, you know, probably remembers what they were doing even, uh, you know, maybe not. Maybe you've got to be 25, but nine. 11 was a big one and this is a, you know a state sponsored terror where our country or you know possibly you know the deep state within this country in allegiance with you know say other countries and I'm not going to pinpoint anyone and and this is why we have you on because you were you know <laughs> right in yes. the center of all this stuff and so uh, let's flesh this out a little bit I know Rachel's got some questions and uh uh well, you know yeah, you I, Rachel go, go ahead keep going well, no, it's just that, you know, 9-11 is what is why we are have all of these wars going on today. We couldn't have invaded these seven countries that uh, General Clark mentioned. Uh, I think you've pointed them out, too, that, you know, the, the neocons planned to take all these countries down. And, and you were talking about Bush and Rumsfeld and Cheney. Uh, yeah, this was part of their agenda. And, and it's, it's really scary. I, I'm very glad that you bring this up because to me what's frightening is how the younger generation don't know what we know. Knowledge is empowerment every time. Primary sources like me are empowerment. Whether you agree with everything I say or not, 
uh, you know, your audience out there. Um, the, the, we knew about 9-11. I first learned about 9-11 in April of 2001 from my CIA handler. Dr. Richard Fuse, and he called me into his office, and he said that he called me on the phone, and we talked on the phone every single day. He was a very good friend of mine. We were very close, and he, I, I respected him. I trusted him. I thought he had my back. I never would have imagined that any of this could go down, um, but it, we were so close that what happened later on shows how deeply frightened and threatened he was in order to back away from me so completely. But he did. <laughs> but at the time, in April of 2001, he called me on the phone. He said, when are you going to New York? I had, uh, for since 1995, I had established, so by, by that time, six years, I had established contacts with Libya and Iraq, and I had been a back channel to the the embassies in New York for classified intelligence. It was totally covert at every level. No one except the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency and the White House, and only a few people at the White House, knew what I was doing. Um, Everything I did was watched very heavily. But I had been going up to New York. But the ABC News, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News had no idea that such a thing existed. And if you talk, if you ask some, you know, so-called mucky muck talking head today, well, was there a back channel? They'd say, oh, I'm CNN. No, there wasn't. Well, that's just wrong. There was. And I was it. So I got a call. And the whole point of the back channel was that when Iraq needed to communicate something confidentially, always, most of it, most of it involved anti-terrorism because uh, there were certain issues, even during sanctions and during hostilities, that we still needed to keep track of whatever they knew. And whatever whatever was going on in the Middle East, we needed a source to be able to get that information, and that was me. Um, so... <laughs> And as this back channel, uh, you know, really, you know, today we see all this stuff about, uh, you know, the email leaks and all this paper stuff or electronic data and that. But the old way of doing it that, you know, apparently you're almost like at the, at the end of that way of doing business. And, and so, you know, you were the courier. You were, it, it was in your head. Human, human intelligence was the, the big thing until electronics. And electronic surveillance, in my opinion, misses 90%. See, as human intelligence, I can just go through and I know the history of what's happened. I know the psychology. I know the emotional content. I can, like, if you've got a, if you've got a question, I, I have it at my fingertips. And I can, I know it in my brain and then I can go and say, well, here's the document that supports what I'm saying to you. Right. So I, I can be, I, I work from my, from my direct contact and direct in, interaction with these people and then I pull out whatever you actually need from my files. And, and so, you know, I did possess extre- you know, now it's, you know, 15 years later and my work would no longer be totally confidential. But back in the, back in the day, it, it you know, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, it was, it was, it was hyper, hyper, hyper confidential and secret tops uh, top secret and above and so Susan, i have a question um about what you were doing compared to wikileaks how do you feel about wikileaks because so much of what america and the world is consuming is like they'll be on twitter and they'll say wikileaks says this the, the basic you know, i love uh, wikileaks you you love it okay i love 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 wikileaks I do. I believe deeply that our entire society benefits from direct access to the most intelligence you can get. I think that an educated public makes better decisions and better guidance to politicians. And it scares me to see anybody in the demo, like the Hillary Clinton crowd, calling those people traitors. Pompeo. The CIA director called WikiLeaks a traitor. You know, Trump was right on the camp, was correct on the ta- campaign trail when he said Julian Assange is our hero. You know, I, I, Trump said it first. He said, I love WikiLeaks. And I was like, yeah, you're going to be my president. 
I mean, really and truly, really and truly, why are you, not you, I realize you're not the ones who are attacking it, but anybody out there who's attacking Trump, you need to realize he is fighting the deep state for all of us, and he's got to win or we are all going to lose. They're going to take our rights. The Democrats are the big, massive surveillance state. The Democrats are the party of corruption. They are so dangerous, and they eschew all, abjure all responsibility for their actions. They, they're, they, they run from one lie to the next lie, and they've got the, the corporate media feeding you this lies. And every well, okay. time... So we're going to come back, but, but let's come back to the I'm going to drag you back to 9-11 because uh, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do here is to get people to talk, you know, across the lines. And so if we, you know, I, I, okay, I, Rachel and I think both went to uh, independent a long time ago and we, you know, went through the Ron Paul revolution and saw how badly we were treated. But we noticed that, you know, they constantly try to tell us that we only have two choices, Republican or Democrat. And I think both sides are getting dilute, uh, disillusioned with their parties and so uh one of our listeners uh, chatters is asking you know how were you told about 9-11 uh you didn't really say or is that uh that's, that's you, right no no i'll, I'll tell you i can talk about that um what i was i was summoned to my that that's a good background about how things worked and in, in for in my what i was dealing with the the i was dealing with the ambassadors and senior diplomats at the iraqi and libyan embassies i also had communications with Egypt and Syria and Yemen. Okay, so I uh, received a phone call from my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and he said, come to my office. I, I, I need you to go to New York, and I need you to deliver a message, and I, and I need you to go right away. I said, okay, fine. That's what I did. That I had no problem with that. Uh, I was used to this. I'd done it for many years by this point, and I had, you know, had good relationships with the Iraqi diplomats and the Libyan diplomats and the ambassadors, all of them. So I'd walk into the embassy. They'd know immediately who I was and what I was there to do. Okay, so uh, Richard Fuse said to me, uh, I have a message for you. We need to get information on any information that the Iraqis possess about – uh, airplane hijackings, uh, we, and we, we, airplane hijackings, and we think, uh, there's gonna be some kind of strike on the World Trade Center. We, uh, we want the Iraqis to know that if there, if this attack occurs, uh, we are going to consider that an act of war against the United States and we're liable to go to war with them. I said, oh, well, I'll be happy to take that message. Sure, not a problem. This is April of 2001. And Iraq had always been our best source of terrorism intelligence. They were very good to us. Uh, they, Saddam Hussein recognized this was one strength that he possessed, that he could play this card, that the United States would always, you know, he wanted to, you should have listened to him. You really were dumb not to listen to him. Uh, he said, you know, Iraq, we are a secular people. We're against the Islamic radicals. We think that they're very dangerous. We want to help you contain them. So he always proved it by being very, very, very helpful. One of our best sources was Saddam Hussein. Now, I go up to New York and I said, hey, guys, uh, but you guys are really great. And uh, I know that in February... Okay, so I said I delivered this message. I, I delivered this message, and and I said, by the way, and so the, the Iraqi diplomats said, okay, we'll send that message by cable to Baghdad, no problem. Hey, you know, you know that in February we already agreed, and uh, former Ambassador Saeed Hassan, who's now the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iraq, he already agreed that if you want to, that if the FBI wants to come over to Iraq. You're welcome to do it. If you think there's something going on, come on over. Sure, we'll process the visas and you can come right on in and do an investigation. Sure, go ahead. Tell them, tell them we'll send the cable to, to, uh, tell them we'll send the cable to, uh, ba Baghdad and just have the FBI call us. I said, okay, great. I went back down to New York, to Washington 
and Richard Fuse called me up. He said, come to see my office. I want a debriefing. I said, oh, great. I gave him a debriefing. I said, yeah, they're going to cooperate. They're sending the cable to, 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 uh, to uh, excuse me, to Moscow. <laughs> sending the cable to Baghdad. We're cool. Everybody's fine. They're going to, they, they told you to send the FBI and they'll process the visas and this is no problem. He said, I didn't tell you to be nice to those people. I said, what? <laughs> what? They're our allies. They're not allies, but they're, they're a great source of intelligence. We've never had any problems with Baghdad before. What are you talking about? He said, I told you, and he began screaming. I told you to tell those blankety, 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 sand niggers is the word he used, those towel heads, those MFers, blankety, blankety, blanks, cursing a storm storming around his conference desk. I told you to tell them that if they don't give us the bloody, 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 bloody intelligence, mucky, mucky, mucky words, all kinds of obscenities, then we're going to bomb them harder than they've ever been bombed before. We're going to bomb them back to the Stone Age. Now, you go back to New York and bloody well you deliver the message exactly as I said. And don't come back and say that they're going to be gracious and helpful. That's not what I told you to do. You are to deliver the message exactly as I said. And tell them this message comes from the highest levels of government above the Secretary of State, and above the director of the CIA. Now, audience, those are only three individuals. That is the President of the United States, George Bush. That is the Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney. And it is the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. So as of April... You have the, uh, the, the, uh, the top government attacking the Iraqis. And let me, you, you take this for one second. My cat is screeching in the background. Okay? <laughs> okay? Okay. She's like, I'm talking. I want your attention. So t- take this for one okay, second. Okay, thanks. Okay. Now listen to me, Rob. Yes. Here's my question. So this was April. She knows all this going on in April before September 11th. How many months? So that's how many months? They're talking about it. The clip you just played before the show was Condoleezza. Sorry about that. Okay. So Condoleezza Rice, we were just talking about the clip before the show, was Condoleezza Rice saying nobody could imagine this. Meanwhile, you, um, Susan, you're telling us that everybody has been imagining this, or at least everybody in your world. Your everybody in my world at the very top of the government, and they had already decided as of April and May of 2001, that Mm -hmm. if the attack occurred, Iraq would pay the price, that they would threaten Iraq with war. And so my CIA handler was trying to get, uh, my, my, we, we are, we are preventive measures. Okay. We are prevention and we are proactive. And I can tell you that on our side of this, we would never have dropped this ball and we never did. But what we found was, uh, so I went back in May to the Iraqi embassy, and I delivered the message, and I said, you know, this comes from the very top of the government, and apparently I was too, they've chastised me for being too modest in my statements to you before. And he said, oh, dear. I said, yeah. Apparently they're very anxious, they're very aggravated and anxious about this, and you need to send a cable to Baghdad that we need everything you've got as rapidly as you can get it to me. And I'll come back anytime. And he said, well, you know, and the diplomat was like, well, you know, we told you, you know, again, we told you in February that you can send the FBI in, and if you think there's really a serious threat here, please, you know, I'll, you, I'll be here, I, I will leave a message in the embassy that they should contact me immediately if the FBI, at any moment the FBI comes in and I will process your visas myself. We'll get the FBI into Baghdad. Now this is May of 2001. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they're saying, come, you know, oh, we'll process your visas immediately and, uh, we can, we can get that, we can get this turned around for you. I can guarantee this and I'll make sure everybody's alerted. To, to come get me immediately if, if they show up. 
So that was Iraq's response in May of 2001. Subsequently, they, the, the Baghdad sent, you know, all through the summer, all through the summer, my CIA handler and I, every week, we, we, every week we'd have meetings, and every week he'd talk about 9 11, we'd talk about this 9 11 attack. Um, very quickly, I know, I remember. Did, did that, they ever bring up the, the PNAC document, you know, that? No. Uh, okay, no, so that wasn't, never, that never. was the neocons in the bathroom. Never. That's never, tough. never. Yeah, I okay. know what it is, but they never talked about that. They and never talked about that. One other character that I remember being on, you know, whenever they talked about Iraq, he was featured as almost as often as Saddam Hussein himself, and that was the second in command who did most of the foreign travel, I believe. And Tariq Aziz. Tariq Aziz. And he was a Christian, by the way, for those who think that, you know, Iraq was just a bunch of, you know, Muslims over there. Uh, Tariq Aziz was a, a Christian. So did you ever have any contact with him or, you know, what, what I, can you I did not have contact with Tariq Aziz uh, uh, because Tariq would, Aziz was intelligent, or excuse me, I was doing intelligence and Tariq Aziz was foreign, was, was not in, there, there's a difference. There, there's a, there's a soft difference, but it's important that he would not get tagged as a spy. That was one of the reasons he could travel was that he was not tagged as an Iraqi spy. So he was very careful not to meet me. Though there was one time I was in the embassy and the United States was bombing Baghdad while Iraq, while Tariq Aziz was in the embassy and I was there downstairs and he was upstairs. And but but yeah but but Tariq Aziz and I never met because exa- for exactly that reason because Tariq Aziz could never afford to be tagged as as for espionage it right. would have been disastrous. I just found it very interesting that, you know, he lived out the rest of his days in prison. And, you know, I don't know if he was being interrogated or debriefed. I'm sure he probably was. But uh, I would have loved to heard, you know, some of the stuff that he could have told us about what was going on in the back channels. Because I'm sure he had, uh, you know, he's privileged to a lot of information. But No, that's cool. That's cool. Um, but, yeah, but that's, that's great. Um, but that's what, anyway, that's what happened throughout the summer uh, of of 2001 for months we talked about it we knew ve- we had a very specific idea of what was going to happen that it would involve airplane hijackings and a strike on the world trade center as a known target and i'll tell you something originally the i regard this as a, as a backdrop for the quote official story of 911 I think that the one of the I have come to decide that in in, in retrospect um, I did not originally think this, but I've come to see it this way uh, that they were establishing a cover for the official story and they were trying to build a legend for it. That's what it's called, a legend. So they're creating a fake history of what's going on. So they're trying to say, look, the CIA was really concerned about this. The CIA really tried to get this information. Iraq would not provide it. But of course, that story then backfires. But we owe in the original official story. The original official story always included bombs. And I think that's important. We always said that there would be a mini nuke somehow it was always a mini nuke, uh, not the thermate or anything like that. No types of derivatives of, of explosives. It was a mini nuke that we expected would bring down the towers and that when the airplane hijacking occurred and the airplane struck the World Trade Center, the mini nuke would be detonated. And I remember saying, I don't understand. And I remember Paul Hoven, my defense intelligence handler, saying, you know, we talked about this all the time and all the time and saying, but but in, if an airplane strikes the World Trade Center, how will that detonate the nuke? Because we all know that we know that that uh, an airplane crash does not is not sufficient to de- detonate a nuclear attack. It has to be there's a there's a, a sequence of of 
coding that has to be, you know, that, that it comes into play. So, so, so just how, you know, how are they going to get the bomb? How are they going to get a nuke on an airplane? And even if they, the airplane strikes the World Trade Center, how are they going to detonate the nuke? I kept asking that question over and over. Can I ask, how will that can I ask you a question? So you guys already had it in your head that there's going to be airplanes, that there was going to be some sort of bomb. Was it just the CIA or was it the other agencies starting to talk about this too? Oh yeah, the Defense Intelligence Agency was all over it. Everybody. All of the intelligence. It was the buzz. Everybody was talking about it as far as I knew. Everybody. Yeah. But you see, anti-terrorism was, um, smaller, much smaller. It was looking for a push. Well, we got the show okay. 24. We got 24. Remember 24, that show? Do you remember it? Yeah, Nine yeah. TV? Yeah, so it was right around that time. They were already playing that. They were no, but, 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 they, but they, they were trying to push terrorism as a big event. Yeah. As a main event. But back in the day, when I did anti-terrorism, I gave advance warning about the 93 World Trade Center attack. That's how I got into this. Um, I did, I was not aware of, uh, I was young. I was 29 years old. I did not know about the FBI involvement, but I knew about the attack and I told some people, I told the Tunisian, the Tunisian embassy about it, uh, for my own reasons that I'm not at liberty to, to discuss with you. Why I went to the Tunisians, I'm not going to tell you. But I did. And I knew that it would involve Egyptian radicals from the south of Egypt, who were trying to assassinate Hosni Mubarak. So I contacted the Tunisians, which turned out to be a very good move. And that's all I can say. Uh, and, but they you knew that I, they knew that I was capable of interacting with diplomats and that I would be confidential and that I could put together terrorism scenarios on my own, on my own capability. So I'd already done this. I already gave advance warning also about the bombing of the USS Cole. That intelligence came from the Iraqis. Uh, we'd had a lot of little in, of information about smaller attacks. But I want to emphasize, these were real attacks. Okay? They were now very important. The USS Cole is a very good example of a real attack that is exploited. It's, it's a variation of a false flag. Because real terrorists plan it out, and the United States tracks the intel, finds out intelligence about it, and then the United States stands down and lets it happen, so mm-hmm. that they can negotiate with, Ye- in this case, Yemen. And I was good friends with the deputy ambassador of Yemen, so I actually told the deputy ambassador of Yemen before five days before the attack. Five days before the attack, I to- I went up to my uh, the deputy ambassador Al Sindi, and I told him about it myself. And I said, "You need to be thinking about how you you are going to cooperate with the United States in addressing this threat when it happens. You need to have a plan." Because I was sick to death of seeing like Libya and Iraq under sanctions. Poor Yemen is, they're, they're, they're an impoverished people. They're some of the, they're dirt poor. They're the most, the most hungry, hard scrabbled people anywhere on the earth. And I, I grieve for these people. So I was like, I don't want you to end up under sanctions. You need to figure, you need to be able to deal with this so that you don't fall under the, sw- of what's happened to all these other to these yeah. other okay, sanctions, sanctions. Yeah. That brings us back to Iraq. Is that why you were dealing with Iraq at that time? Because they were I was deeply under I was deeply opposed to sanctions. Right. We were killing, right. Yeah. Which the sanctions? The, the uh, neoliberals, warmongers, neoliberal warmongers, and the neoconservative warmongers both deride the com- the impact of sanctions. But sanctions killed. Um, between 1.7 million and 2.2 million Iraqis. Right, right. And it's and, just, and, and I and I and do please do not argue with me on these figures. No, I, I will know not. the figures. No, uh, Madison Albright in 1990 at the beginning of 1996, Madeline Albright was asked about 500,000 children 
under the age of five. Mm-hmm. The, the, the United Nations and the World Health Organization only counted children five and under and adults over the age of 65. They did and not. I have that clip. I have that clip. I'm going to roll it right now so people will know what, it, what you're talking about. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Oh, Madeleine Albright. Yep. And you've got to realize the sanctions, that was in 1996. The sanctions continued for another seven years, and the children continued to die. So by that was in 500,000 in 96. By 2000, uh, 2003, it was over one million had died. But why, and so, would the, why would the UN? Why would the UN change the numbers like that? Why? Because they're ashamed of it. The United Nations is a, a lazy. It's it's a country club atmosphere. It's- they do, they are, the weak countries get to send, like third world countries get to send their diplomats and their ambassadors to New York and it's a party town. Yeah. It's, a, it's, One like, of, a, it's like a party university. Do you go there to, do you go to, did you go to study or did you go to have, to the, to play sports? Well, you, you know, a lot of people go there for the sports. Yeah, yeah. And that's what it's about in the, at the United Nations. Yeah, one of the congressmen that I dealt with pretty religiously, um, and he's mentioned in my books to the people that have read my books, and I've, in my book he's called Stan the Congressman. I asked him one time in real life, I said, well, why can't the U.N. do anything? He said, because they're the most useless organization out there. And I was like, are you kidding me? Because I grew up with this idea that the U.N. was, like, all powerful. He said it's the most useless organization out there. It's kind of, And like you just said, it's like a country club. Blew me away. So you're saying exactly what a congressman is. It's you very Congress. disappointing. Very disappointing. And I'll tell you, I am somebody who believes that it could be so good. It could be so necessary to have a, a, a meeting place for different countries. But then you see Angelina Jolie tapped as mm-hmm. a, or Madonna. I think was once. Uh, no, uh, you know, Madonna. Um, I don't know if you. It was Madonna. Angelina Jolie. There have been yeah. several who are just. You know, you want to. You, you're just appalled yeah. that these people are are like goodwill ambassadors, and really they just want their. They just. They they want their their photo snaps. They want their. They want their cocktail hour. They have very big cushy apartments in New York City. Uh, there, you know, it's, it's a good life. Yeah. It is a, it is the best life that anybody, I mean, anywhere on the planet, yeah. you don't get better than that. You well, really a lot don't. of guys get appointed because of their, you know, because of their fundraising, you know, to get someone elected, right? That's how you get. Well, in- or in, but in third world countries, they, it's, it's a promotion for the a family of, um, you know, like if if you have a tyrant government, then you reward your supporters by giving them this this uh, sycophant. What do you call it? Sinecure position. It's a sinecure position. So mm-hmm. you you get your you know you get your you you get your kid off to Harvard and you get to go be the ambassador to the country or be a diplomat for the country. It's a very prestigious thing for those countries to do. It really is. And a lot of them, they'd have no opportunities if they were at home at all. So anyway, you to come back to 9-11 and, yeah, and what was going on. Back. So, yeah, yeah so pull, pull it back going on. People are dying. Yeah, so, so we have, but we have, uh, so I, that's why I was doing it was to oppose the sanctions. And I was, I was very offended by it. But at the same time that 9-11, in the, in the months before 9-11, I was also, involved in negotiations to resume the weapons inspections. And I was in direct contact with the Iraq's ambassador and senior diplomats on the Security Council, also Malaysia, Yemen, as I mentioned already. Um, and so we had uh, the, the, the whole world had become sick to death of this appalling and immoral policy. The United Nations could not stomach it any longer. 
They wanted peace with Iraq. Everybody was looking at Iraq's oil supplies. Iraq was cutting deals on the side with all these different countries saying, you know, hey, come help me, come help us get our sanctions off. And as soon as sanctions are lifted, Japan and South Korea will buy automobiles from you and we'll buy medical supplies from you and we'll buy all these, you know, and, 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 you know, here's a, we got to rebuild our entire economy. Everything in our economy we have to build from scratch. So we have to start over because we've been gutted to zero. And so all of these European countries are looking, oh, this, this deeply immoral policy of killing all these children versus a peace dividend that would have rivaled the reconstruction of Germany and Japan. And they're all looking at this and going, oh, this is a good deal. Let's do it. So the United States and Britain had become very isolated. And everyone and a lot of people, the French knew I was doing it. The Malaysians knew I was doing it. And they were all hoping I would succeed in getting George Bush on board. And so they, this was in the day. And people, life. this is how much life has changed. It used to be that the United States called the tune and we would have to be satisfied before any resolution of sanctions was undertaken. It used to be that people actually cared what we thought, not because of our moral authority, because we'd never had moral authority. We just wink, wink at it. But what we had was power, raw power and economic muscle. So, well, Jim, I, I want to talk a little bit about Iran because, I mean, Iraq, excuse me, because before we went in Bobnum, that was a very, very Western nation, you know, and I mean, you could you know, look through Baghdad in some of those early pictures and it looked like it might be a city in New Mexico. And I think you mentioned on one of your podcasts, I hope I didn't get this wrong, but they were the second country in the world to ever actually perform a, a human heart transplant. And so that shows yeah. that they were really very advanced. And, uh... Yes, they were. They were very, very advanced. And it's so sad what we did to those countries, the, the, to Iraq. Uh, they had the a, a, a hospital medical care that rivaled all of Europe and, you know, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles and Sloan Kettering in New York and the Mayo Clinic. We, they had the, they had the best health care in the Middle East and people would come from all over the Middle East to go to their hospitals. And they had fancy cars and fancy clothes and they were very westernized. Yeah. They were highly Europeanized, highly, uh, they, they truly, Saddam were, considered that Iraq was the buffer against Iran and a buffer against the Islamic radicals. And he was suppressing the Shia somewhat, but not like you've been told. That is totally not true. Uh, But what we see is that he was suppressing Islamic radicalism, whether it was Sunni or Shiite. The Islamic radicals of any denomination were suppressed. They were. That is factually true. But that's also what we wanted. Okay, we supported that. And so let's not pretend that Saddam was doing anything except what we wanted him to do. We were very, that was the part of Saddam that we all liked. And he tried to play on that for us by saying he would not deal with Islamic radicalism. He did not like it, did not want any. He considered that Islamic radicals would take advantage of the deep, poverty and despair of the Iraqi people under sanctions and that they would torpedo his his uh, modernity, his modernism, his secularism. Um, and so he built a lot of mosques. He, he tried to balance it by building mosques, but he and beautiful, beautiful mosques, huge, magnificent, beautiful mosques. Even during sanctions, which was really extraordinary, uh, if you if you when I think of what Saddam Hussein was able to do with nothing, with just sheer force of will and determination and ingenuity, with no money at all, and and but but if you think about it, what has the desert got? The desert has got sand. Duh. 
Okay, the desert has got sand. What do you need for concrete? Sand. So what could they do? They could build. They built stadiums. They built palaces. They built a lot of mosques. But he suppressed, but the imams that he put into power at those mosques were controlled moderates at all times. He did not tolerate any extremists. He screened, he scrutinized them very closely. Now, this, okay. is, the bath, this is the bath party? Yes, the bath oh. party. But he, he was, sorry? you know, he, it was the bath party, yes. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. yeah. okay. Just like Syria, just like Syria, what, uh, Hafez al-Assad, the senior uh, father of Bashar al-Assad. But there was no reason for this war. The Anyway, the coming back to 9-11, I think that the reason for 9-11 was that the world was so exhausted of this sanctions. The world wanted peace with Iraq. If you had gone into, if George Bush and the neocons had gone to the United Nations, as, as weak and me- mediocre as they are, and said, well, we want to have a war. It, they would have, they would have been, it would have been the one thing the United States could never do. It just, it was just, it was impossible. They had to have a Pearl Harbor scenario so that they could get the war of their dreams. Right. Okay? Yeah. And that was 9-11. I, I, I have this uh, short clip from V from, uh, for Vendetta that, uh, it's, you know, it's basically what, uh, what's going on here. You know, whether it's Manchester or 9-11, it's kind of, uh, what they do. What we need right now is a clear message to the people of this country. This message must be read in every newspaper, heard on every radio, seen on every television. This message must resound throughout the entire interlink. I want this country to realize that we stand on the edge of oblivion. I want every man, woman, and child to understand how close we are to chaos. I want everyone to remember why they need us. In the former United States, civil war continues to devastate the Midwest. So, yeah. That's- oh, civil war in the Midwest. We may be pretty close to that, people. We'll get to that in the end yeah. of the show. Yeah, I know. Be, you know, before we go to our things. break, though, uh, Susan, before we go to our break, you know, y- y- you're right. But in- no, I don't want to go to break right now. No, no, I, we're not right now, but I, I, I want you to talk about uh, how did you get into this position? I mean, you, you've you lived this life of intrigue that, you know. Oh, well, now, before before we do that, uh, I there's a lot of things I can't tell you. So I don't want to, I don't want, I've told you what I can tell you about my background and how I did already. But, but let me, let me just say that, that the reason for 9-11 was that peace, this is very important, I think. The reason for 9-11, when it comes down to it, is that peace was breaking out all over the world. And I want you to think about that. I want your audience to think about peace versus 9-11, and I want you to all to think about the whole Russia collusion meme and the demonization of Moscow. Why are we doing this? There is no reason for this. What they're doing to Trump, Trump wants collaboration with ISIS. That's a very good policy that would solve the problem, probably. Syria and Russia have been beating ISIS. Uh, Aleppo has already come back to Syrian control. The, 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 the ISIS fighters and the Islamic radicals have been pushed farther and farther out, uh, towards Raqqa, towards Turkish, the Turkish Kurdistan t- territories. And they, believe me, Moscow and Syria are, are kicking booty to get this thing done. They are so scared of what's going to happen to the United States. But they're winning. Okay, they are winning right now. So as far as I'm concerned, those are the good guys. Standing with Syria and Assad, Assad is like, uh, just like Saddam was, very secular, um, very tolerant. There are 22 sects, religious sects in Syria, and all of them receive protection. Christian, Muslim, the Aramaic language of Jesus Christ is spoken at a little village in Syria to this day, and they re- and the the local imams 
protect them and they worship each other's holidays and they celebrate each other. They had the most beautiful Christmas tree in Aleppo and the whole, I mean, amazing Aleppo had just fallen and they had a Christmas tree. It's not like a tree with, you know, like a, like a wooden tree. <laughs> it's a tree of lights that they had. But it was just magnificent considering that they had just come through this, this hideous war. Russia is cleaning up the IEDs and the, the explosive, the booby trapped buildings. They're clearing out the rubble and people are going back to Aleppo to their apartments and their houses. Even though there is no, what they say is there are no walls. Okay, they go back to the apartment where they've lived for 20 years or where they're uh, 50 years and there are no walls. There is no kitchen. There is just a floor. Some and they're sweeping it out and they're building their lives all over again. It's it's it is a story of of resilience. And we should all be so proud of Syria for this. And what what are the deep state doing John McCain, Ron Wyden, I will never forgive Ron Wyden, Adam Schiff, all these crazy Nancy Pelosi Democrats screaming, we want war, we want war. The neoliberals are just as awful as the neoconservatives. And I want you to think, what was Iraq like under peace? Why? What did you gain from 9-11? What it bankrupted our country. We now have a 20 trillion dollar deficit mm -hmm. and we are in the same situation right now with Iran and with Russia. OK, and now the crazy warmongers screaming Russia, Russia, Russia in my head, Russia, Russia in my bed, Russia, Russia everywhere, Russia, Russia, snowflakes scared. Oh, I just yeah. That I'm was, serious. No, that I, is what I hear you 100%. It's like these children. It is a children's nursery rhyme. You got, not you guys, but the no, audience out there, you are making up a children's story. That's my point. It I, is a I, children's I agree with you 100%. story demonizing, demonizing Russia. And it's just like before 9-11. It is. Just like before 9-11. Susan, since we just talked about Syria a little bit, how great it was, why do you think Trump decided to bomb that airport? Oh, well, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, it was actually a good choice. That airport is where um, there was a depot at, the, at that airport supplying weapons to both sides of the conflict. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it was a weapons depot at the airport and... ISIS fighters and Syrian fighters were both stocking up there. So what they did was he destroyed the weapons used in the war. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, President Trump, I love you even more. <laughs> because so that really is exactly what they should have done. They did not. They didn't. They, they, it was a targeted attack. I think the worst part of it is that it took 59 cruise missiles. And only 23 got through. Yeah. That is a bad sign yeah, a that we're spending this huge money, huge waste. You know, it's not fraud in that situation. There's a lot of fraud, but the huge waste and most of these weapons, half of the weapons don't even work. They're just yeah. duds. No, it's exactly true. That um, Remember the smart bomb when it first came out during Iraq? That whole thing, they would have it on TV and they'd have like, they'd show the smart bomb flying direct uh -huh. to a doorway. And I was doing marketing communications for this defense contractor where we made the gyroscopes for that bomb. And this was like the biggest hilarious thing. They'd always show these pictures of it going straight through a doorway. I'll tell you how many of those, it was literally three that actually hit its target of the original smart bombs out of those huge shipment of those smart bombs. Only three wow. actually hit what it was supposed to do. Wow. Yeah. A huge waste. And, and, and I'll tell you, Russia has better technology and a more, oh, here we go. We'll be right back. <laughs> that was so interesting. <laughs> so thank you. That's yeah. Right on. We're going to be here for the next hours. I'm in 
extreme. That's how I feel after this first hour with Susan Lindauer. We're covering all sorts of things. I thought we'd be just focusing on 9-11 because she's a first-hand account from inside the U.S. intelligence agency. And we haven't even heard the half of our story. We haven't even got it up to 9-11 yet. We just know now that the whole entire intelligence world knew about 9-11 before it happened. And the story that they told us on the news about how no one could ever anticipate anything like that ever happening, planes smashing to a building, we couldn't have foreseen that. Well, that's a whole load of BS. They did know about it. And so there's all these people out there marching around that knew this was going to happen. And Susan was at that place where she but she's going to take us through what happens next. Obviously, everybody knows 9-11 well, it is happened. A, an integral part of, you know, how, you know, whoever the deep state is and whatever agency they use, you know, uh, and this happens all over the world. And it's kind of part of, I, I guess we probably don't have time to go into like Project Gladio, but, you know, take some time and look it up if you've never heard it before. And uh, But we're going to talk about their assets, uh, whether they're FBI or CIA. And an asset isn't necessarily always somebody that's working for the government. It might be someone who ends up being a, a patsy. Is that correct, Susan? Or Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, a patsy, but they usually know that they are. But, but before we, before we get into that, I want to tell you what happened in August of 2001, the month before 9-11. There's a huge flurry of activity tied to, uh, and I can tell you it was timed exactly. I can tell you the days because of Robert Mueller's Senate confirmation hearings to head the FBI. He had just been named FBI director, and on the day that this that my internal clock starts was the day of his Senate confirmation hearings. And I was on the phone. I was at a, uh, doing a, a consulting job, and I was at, on the job at the office. And I spoke with my CIA handler by phone, and I said, you know. Uh, we, we were talk, we were talking and I said, oh, Robert Mueller, he, there's never been a case he doesn't throw. He said, oh, what are you talking about? I said, oh, Oklahoma City is a one. And I said, uh, and he, and Richard said, well, what's really going to be disturbing is if there's no FBI director when this terrorism attack goes on. And I said, you think it's going to be soon? And he said, oh, I think it's imminent. I think the attack is imminent, and what's going to happen if he's not even confirmed when uh, when there's no FBI if there's no FBI leadership when this goes down? And I said, oh, and and he said, yeah, it's imminent. And I said, well, then I'll go back up to New York and I'll go see my Iraqi ex or my my Iraqi um, embassy friends and see if they've got any news from Baghdad. Now this was, oh gosh, I'm going to say August second. August 2nd. That was, it was a Thursday, August 2nd. And, uh, and Richard's response was, oh no, don't go up there. It's too dangerous. It is too dangerous. I do not want you going to New York. Um, th- we're expecting mass casualties in this attack. And you shouldn't be up there until after it's over. So I said, well, you know, it's, I'll just go up real fast and I won't spend the night. I'll just come right back. I'll just come right back to New York, or right back to Washington, D.C. I'll just drive up for the day, have my meetings, and come home. And he said, good, don't spend the night. Don't spend the night, and then after this, don't go back. Because we were, at this point, always expecting. The official story originally was airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center as a known target, but also a miniature nuke. That was, we always believed the towers would come down. Where always. was, can I ask a question? Where was that information coming from, Susan? That was coming from the CIA. So the CIA, but what source were they getting it from? We, I have no idea. Oh, yeah. I, I was getting it from my CIA handler. That's what I know. Yeah, okay. I cannot speculate where it was coming where he right. got it from, except he got it from, we all, we, it's just, by this point, we all just knew what was going oh, to happen. Right. We all knew what was going to happen exactly. We were all, it, we'd all been, the story had already been planted in our brains and we were already ruminating over it. So how, so how do people... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, go ahead. Uh, let, let me, I gotta tell you the sequence of events. Okay, yeah, tell me the whole so thing. So August 2nd, uh, is Robert Mueller's Senate 
confirmation hearing. August 4th, I go up to New York. And my Iraqi diplomat friends say, ah, Susan, you know, you've been asking us this all summer long. We just don't have anything. Believe me, you know, they're scratching their heads. They're like, we know that if there, if this attack goes down, we're going to get bombed into the Stone Age, but we just don't have anything to give you. We just don't know anything at all. The only people who know about, here's very important. The only people who know about this attack are you. You know, you are the source. When we all of our all of our all of our intelligence is back tracing to Washington. In other words, there's no. We're not hearing anything from the Saudis. We're not hearing anything from the Germans. Everything is tracing back to you. So I said to them, "Okay, well, I'll just go back and and I went back to that was August fourth. Now mm-hmm. on August sixth is a very important date because. They gave um, the uh, the presidential briefing memo to uh, Donald uh, to excuse me Donald Trump to George Bush in Crawford, Texas, and oh gosh, was it Richard? I want to say it's Richard Clark who gave it to him. Uh, I think that's who it was. But they gave him the presidential briefing memo. He said, "Yeah, yeah. Oh, the CIA keeps talking about this this attack. Yeah, yeah. You've covered your your you you CYA CYA." You've covered your butt. Now let's go play golf. That was George Bush. Mm-hmm. And at the same time that he was having that, con- uh, that Richard Clark was having that conversation with Bush, I was in the meeting with my CIA handler saying, how are we going to get this information to the president? Or how are we going to get this? How are we going to get action on this? Not, not how are we going to get it to the president? How are we going to get, uh, Action. How can we trigger this a response so we can stop this attack? And we talked about two things. One, my cousin was Andrew Card, chief of staff to George Bush. And so I told Richard I would go see him. And I did. I went and sat outside his house for about two hours, chain smoking. It was when I still smoked cigarettes chain smoking in my car while the neighbors looked out of their windows and their curtains at the this car parked in front of the chief of staff to George Bush it was very you know i was like oh god i half expected the 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 uh the the police to show up and the Fairfax County police to show up and say uh what are you doing here woman please leave <laughs> i was like you know where is he i got to speak to andy i got to find andy the other thing that i did which was did, very did you find him No, he never came back. He was on, he was on, August is the month when everything shuts down in Washington. And he was gone for the holidays. So I left and I felt like I was making the biggest mistake of my life. That I had to talk to him and, 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 and I would regret that for like for the rest of my life if I didn't speak to him. And for years I, or not for years, but for, for a long time after 9-11 I did regret it. But the other thing that I did, uh, now, this was August 6th that I had the conversation with Richard Fuse. It's August 8th that I, 8th, maybe August 9th, maybe August 9th that I go see Andrew Card for two hours and say, August 9th, maybe even August 10th that I do that, Thursday or Friday. But on August 8th, which was Wednesday, I telephoned the office of a tur- now, this is historic for me. This is what triggers my crisis. I telephoned the office of Attorney General John Ashcroft. I had been given a an inside DOJ phone number for emergencies in the event that I was ever not able to speak to my handlers, Richard or Paul. There had been a couple of situations when I had been in danger when I, because of my background, because of what I was doing, I was either in danger or um, I once had an Iraqi try to defect through me, and they uh, it, it didn't go quite the way that everybody wanted. Wished that it had gone later on, and my excuse was, well, I didn't know how to. It was nighttime; I didn't know how to get hold of you. So they gave me a phone number to call in in an emergency, and they said, whoever answers this phone will be able to look across the room and see Attorney General John Ashcroft. He will have the message in 30 seconds flat. 
This is the number you call. This was the only time I ever used that phone number. But sure enough, I did, and I called, and I said, I have an emergency. I am seeking an emergency. I, I've gone through this so many times in my head because of my later prosecution. I can tell you the exact words that I used. And because of the grief and the disappointment and the bitterness and the sadness over it, I said, um, I retraced myself just over and over, beating myself up over it. I said, I have an emergency broadcast alert across all federal agencies. I, we are seeking, uh, I cover the, the Libya house at the Iraqi embassy. We are seeking any fragment of intelligence involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center as a known target. We expect a miniature thermonuclear device to be used, possibly a suitcase bomb, but we expect mass casualties as a result of the combination of these forces. And, you know, at that point I wasn't even thinking, how are they going to get the bomb into the building? We just thought, we just, everybody was keyed into the fact that the bomb would be used. So we believed the bomb would be there, and we believed that the World Trade Center would be destroyed by the explosion, and everybody was going to die. Thousands of people were going to die. We always knew it. Everything that happens, we knew. Okay. So I said, I need an, I, hold on, hold on. No, no, let me finish, let me finish. Okay. I said, I, I need an emergency broadcast alert. And and DO, the Attorney General's office said, I will give this message to John Ashcroft. And I here is a phone number for the Office of Counterterrorism. Mm. I want you to, hold on, let me finish. I want you to call this number and repeat exactly what you did, what you told me, and tell them. Now, this is very important because when they hung up the phone, Attorney General John Ashcroft apparently said, and this has been reported in other in other media, oh, those CIA, they keep talking about this terrorism attack, ignore it. And John Ashcroft said, ignore it. But, but, because they had given me the phone number for the Office of Counterterrorism, I called those people, and those people did it. As a result, in F- the FBI in Minneapolis, Colleen Rowley, who is, I, um, I respect her very much, but she's not exactly right that the F, that the CIA never told the FBI, and if only we had told the FBI, they would have done something about it. We did tell the FBI, and that is a fact we did. So when she was on the cover of Time Magazine and all, it was nonsense. I, I love the fact that she got to be on the cover of Time Magazine or Newsweek or whatever. You know, Woman of the Year, Whistleblower of the Year. Nonsense, nonsense. I was the Whistleblower of the Year. <laughs> but I was in jail by this point. Oh so I, I, uh, the, 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 the Office of Counterterrorism did put out a bolo on this. And the, office, the FBI office in Minneapolis of all places, who would think it? Who would think they'd be training out there in Minneapolis or it would be in any way connected? But they had picked up Zachary Mosawe and they had his computer. And in response to our request, they said, we've got it right here. Well, isn't this extraordinary? We just picked this guy up. And it turns out he's the missing hijacker. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's the missing hijacker. So they're like, we've got his computer. We want to break it open. We want a FISA approval. We want to have, you know, and, and we want to, we want to have permission. We want a warrant to go into his computer. And John Ashcroft blocked it. Blocked it. Now, this is is the guy that was telling you just ignore it. Yeah. That's right. And so he was covering up. He was blocking the FBI, and and this is very important. This is like the death of JFK when the Secret Service is is ordered to stand down before the assassination. This is, um, you know, nine eleven. You know, this is let it happen versus make it happen. Okay, there is a healthy dose of make it happen just by not taking actions 
that are regular protocols. So they contributed to the, the attack by even the people who were trying to get action, like the FBI in Minneapolis, like me, like 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 our like uh, Richard Clark, who later would deny, would play games about the truth and would deceive the public about this stuff for a long time. I mean, they deceived public, the public about what was in this personal briefing memo and all of this. So so they so so they they lie. There's a lot of lies that are told right at that moment, and and that's why you need to know that there was a lot more knowledge and a lot more attempt to get action, and we were being blocked and punished. But, of course, the, the, the grand kahuna of the lies of all time is this, and you've all heard the story. On the day of – okay, so there's one more thing I need to say. For Apparently, I have learned from a State Department source – that who, who can never go public because he's afraid of losing his pension, that for about 10 days, from about August 23rd till about September 3rd, strange vans were seen entering the parking garage at the World Trade Center at about 3 o'clock in the morning, after, very definitely after, the janitorial trucks had left at about 2.30, so they, they, the janitorial trucks were all out of the building. There was a healthy space of time, about half an hour, and then these mystery vans showed up. And what were they doing inside the World Trade Center? Were they putting something in? Were they taking something out? Where it was both going on? Something was happening. They had never been there before. They left by 5 a.m. every morning. So they arrive 3 o'clock, leave at 5 o'clock a.m. before the early risers, the AAA personalities from Wall Street arrive to go to start their day at the World Trade Center to check the Asian markets. Mm-hmm. And there, so there, so there is some strange activity for about 10 days. Then there's one more thing that every American can verify. On the morning of 9-11 itself, who else but George Bush, President George Bush, who is a man I hate, loathe, detest, and revile, like you cannot imagine. On that morning, he busted out in the emotion and said something. He made a spontaneous confession. He said that before he went into the classroom, now, listen to this, before I went into the classroom. I saw a video on television of the first airplane striking the World Trade Center. And I said to myself, golly, that's a really lousy pilot because I used to fly myself. I said, that pilot, you know, whether it was it a suicide? Was it, you know, golly, that's a lousy pilot. And That is a confession that there was a video, okay? There was a video on site, and that meant, now he was in Florida, and the attack is in New York City, which is how many, a thousand, God only knows, a thousand miles away for the sake of discussion. And yet, had a, the President of the United States had a closed circuit video to monitor the attack as it occurred. Oh that God. requires – that confession right there requires advanced knowledge of the attack. And it's very much like what you see these crazy media doing now, this grossly irresponsible media, fabricating lies and pel- pummeling us and beating us. Trump is bad. Trump is bad. Trump is bad. And – we gotta have war with Russia. We gotta have war with Russia. Oh, Trump's in the way. Trump's collaborating with Russia. Oh, there's collusion. Oh my, we better impeach Trump because we want war with Russia. And all these crazy, dumb little snowflakes are out there saying, oh, Russia. Like I said, it's like a child's story, a children's story. Russia, well, Russia, it's in my they, head. I do not respect you at all. To, uh, 
I am so angry at you. I, I know you are, uh, <laughs> Susan, but like I say, we want to try to uh, build bridges across, you know, and get, uh, you know, the snowflakes drive me crazy, but then so do, uh, you know, the far right. You know, they're they're both. Uh, the new so we have to figure out a way to communicate with each other and, and that. But I, I want to get back to this Trump thing. I mean, this uh, Bush in the in the classroom surrounded by children. Uh, you know, I... I have this sneaking suspicion that, you know, because that um, elementary school was not, you know, far from an airport. And I'm just guessing, you know, what would have happened if uh, a plane would have plowed into that school where Bush was, you know, or something happened where. A, oh, it, no, a, that wasn't going to happen. No, no, no. They, they did, however, have. Well, we let you run for a long, long time. So let me let me just plug this in, because just think about it, you know, had had. Bush died in a classroom full of children, and we know that, you know, from Oklahoma City and other places that they have no problem with killing children. Even, even Matt and Lynn Albright said, well, the price is worth it. Uh, but had he died in there, uh, you know, Dick Tater, <laughs> uh, Cheney would have been, you know, president for a while, and Dick had a bad ticker, and, uh, so it's possible that he might have, you know, they would have said, well, his health isn't good, and w- let's, let's have Jeb stand in, you know, take over for his brother. So, uh, it, it could have happened that, you know. No. No, you can't do that. No, no, sweetie. You can't do that. There is, there is, there is never a possibility of one Bush substituting for another. No. Never. No. Uh, in the in the in the theater of public opinion, they could have no. played. Like no, that. you can't. No, there, you can't. There's you can't a chain of there's a chain of of who takes over in an impeachment process, or in, there's a there's a a survivor. Uh, yeah, no, it's impossible. That's that's one thing I've got to I've got to contradict right away. They can't do that. Okay, I will give you that, but uh, it's something that's played in my mind because yeah, Never. I heard about the you know the Bush. Uh, you know, seeing the video, and I'm a pilot also, and, uh, but there, there's a lot of strange things. You know, you keep, you know, bringing down, uh, mentioning it about a nuke, and yet if you watch the towers coming down, they are being blown apart from the top down. There you go, yes. So yes. it's not but, like. But, but here's the thing, I'm not what, defending a nuke theory. Down, it would have had to be a, a series of them possibly, you know, the, uh, micro nukes, you know, every five, no, ten. No, 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 so, no, let, let me, let me just stop you. What I'm saying to you is that the official story prior to the attack, the legend that they were creating, always included explosives, and it always included destroying the entire World Trade Center. Always. That was the the original story. Now, the reality is, you know, that there might have been a combination of bombs, probably a mini-nuke in the basement, but... Definitely thermite, uh, or, or, or I, excuse me, I would refer you to architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth who studied the dust and, right. and go to science at that point. Go to yeah. science and listen, whatever, you know, the, the people who have, who, who do this for a living and do demolitions, it was a controlled demolition and those are the people who can tell you the type of explosives that were used in real life. I'm just saying to you that it, in the official legend before the attack, there was always explosives used. But we, oh, but in we had yeah. Tony Zamboni on, uh, in who no, he, a real engineer's engineer and number cruncher, and you know he talked about a lot of things. And, and one of the things you know that this is you know a, a lot talk about is the bathtub that the towers were built in, and so it was uh, very important to, to not break that bathtub because everything would have been flooded in lower Manhattan. So how the buildings came down, uh, you know, is still a mystery, even to the architects and engineers. They don't know what did it. All they know is that the official story doesn't hold water. Uh, it wasn't uh, office fires that brought the buildings down. It wasn't jet fuel. Uh, Tony goes through that. There just wasn't enough heat uh, BTUs available to raise the temperature of the steel high enough where they would be even begin to sag and cause the, you know, systematic c- collapse of the building. So, uh, you know, it, it, exactly. It, Tony exactly. did just a wonderful job. He's yeah, a he was a good interview. 
Uh, he's a brilliant guy. But yeah, the, you know, let, let's, you know, let's t- spend some time and talk about assets, you know, about these different guys. Uh, I know Judge Napolitano was on, uh, was on Fox and I, I should have thought to grab this clip, but you know, he talks about of the 14 terrorist, uh, you know, attacks that, uh, the FBI stopped. 12 of them were with, you know, people that the FBI already knew about. And it's the same way with, you know, the, the Zachariah brothers, you know, or, or uh, I get the, I'm pronouncing that wrong. The Boston bombing guys, uh, in this guy in Manchester, this latest one, they all were on the radar of the, you know, of the special police were following them and they knew about these guys in advance before anything happened. So how are they able to walk into an area with all kinds of explosives or weapons? Well, or whatever? in this, in this case, um, I, the, the Tsarnaev brothers in Boston, oh boy, I don't think that our, that their story is known. I think that it's possible the older brother may have been a, an asset, an informant. An asset is like an informant, it's human intelligence. They were obviously being monitored because the police knew there was going to be an attack that day. You know, they, they talked, they, they had, um, they told the runners that they expected a, 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 an attack, uh, you know, a drill that day. And then they let it go live, so to, so to speak. That's one way of doing a false flag. It is gladio. That, that is where, uh, where a false flag becomes gladio because the false flag is, is the fake out that you have the fake out, the impersonation of the attacker, and then the gladio is the desire for chaos and to create bitterness and anger and rage towards a targeted group. So the two often go hand in hand. Gladio uh, goes back to Italy and uh, right the time right after Mussolini when the fascists in Italy wanted to Blaine wanted to um, excoriate the communists in the eyes of the ordinary man. They wanted to stigmatize them as terrorists. So the fascists in Italy went out and they ran uh, a lot of bombings at um, it, a lot of ra- uh, train station bombings and bombings in public squares, bombings right outside churches and places where the people would consider to be sacred and you know, they would be reliable community asset, community resources, like, like those things. So they'd, they'd put up a bomb there. And then they'd blame the, the communists and say, look what those communists did. Ooh, those, those awful communists just bombed our train station. Those awful bombs, uh, communists just bombed our, our churches. And in fact, it was the fascists who were doing it the whole time. Mm-hmm. But it was the, that's Gladio. And so you're you're stigmatizing your enemy, which is what you see throughout all of these attacks. But but like you said, with a false flag, that goes back to the old pirate days where the the pirates would 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 hoist a a, a, a flag that was like the, the the to match the nationality that they were approaching, so that they could get close enough, and then they'd pull it down and say, put hoist the pirate flag in its place and board and and rob and pillage so and the pirate know. flag was the skull and bones <laughs> so I always yeah say. yeah uh-huh. definitely yeah so um but but these these assets the the mohammed atta was definitely an asset they were being they had handlers they were being watched they were being trained in how to use airplanes and fly and these were not jihadists. They were supposed to, they, they would later try to give an imitation of a jihadist, but they threw around a lot of cash. They used a lot of drugs, cocaine. They used a lot of uh, alcohol. They went to strip clubs. There is no jihadist anywhere who would do the kind of behavior. And by now, I hope we know that. Islamic, real, genuine Islamic radicals, they use drugs, they use coke, they use heroin and methamphetamines and, you know, 
And they had blue haired strippers. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, but the, but the real jihadists do not have, um, do not have the blue haired strippers. They've got everything except that. So, but, the, but the, the, the Muhammad Atta crowd, we have knowledge that they were connected to the, they were being overseen by people who are known now to have been fronts for the CIA. They were companies for the CIA. Can I ask a question here, um, Susan? Sure. I have a question. You, especially during that story, you're talking about how you had used that emergency phone number that they gave you to do this all points across all the agencies. How, what would happen? Because you're saying you told the FBI. What would the FBI have done different than the CIA to stop anything? Nothing. I mean, they, okay. they had the, they had the ability to get search warrants. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they, the FBI can, the FBI is domestic. Okay. The CIA is only supposed to be inter, outside the United States. FBI is supposed to be domestic intelligence. Okay. But what the FBI does then is the FBI goes out and says, oh, the CIA never told, now this becomes important in, in the, in the last half hour of the story, um, the CIA, the, the, the FBI wanted to increase their budget. They wanted to increase their mission statement. This terrorism stuff was going to be big money. Mm-hmm. The problem is there's not enough terrorists to go around. In the old days, when we started, there were only about 300 terrorists in the entire world. Mm-hmm. Now think about that. 300. You could only fill a small high school auditorium, maybe a small high school auditorium. If you were to fill it up with every terrorist from every country, that's what you'd have. That's right. You'd have the IRA in there from Ireland. You'd have like all these. Yeah, because that was the big one back then, right? The Irish. And and that is kind of a an Operation Gladio type thing. The whole IRA in Ireland and uh, the uh, I hate to say it, you know if if anybody wants to look into this, I mean uh, James Corbett and Sabell Edmonds have just really done some wonderful work on this. So uh, you know the history of Gladio and you know how it's still with us. It's still going on today, and so. But so, uh, but back to 9/11 though. 9/11 became like a giant commercial to create more terrorists. Yes, exactly. Because you can't have. That's the problem. There weren't enough. There were not enough terrorists to justify the fun investigations that got people money and got people promotions and and. You know, built up the FBI's reputation. They had to go, they had to go recruit. The FBI would go online and they would look for unhappy, uh, unhappy Muslims, a lot of them from Yemen or, I mean, I feel sorry for, I really feel sorry for these people. Somalia got targeted. Now there are some now, now, nowadays, there are real terrorists from Yemen. Right. There are real terrorists from Somalia. And it's like this thing in, in Ariana Grande's conference concert, uh, that just kills my heart because, you know, we, if we had never had Iraq, it, it you know, the terrorism is blowback for our actions. Blowback means that it is a consequence, a punishment, uh, a, a, a cause and effect. We did start this. Our wars in Iraq, in Syria, and Libya, and Yemen have cre- and and all of this have in Sudan have created a a massive rupture and desensitization of violence. And then those people are coming into Europe. They are enraged that the Europeans live so well when they have lost absolutely everything. And there's just blind fury. But people are going to be very upset when I say I support extreme vetting. I have been, I've dedicated my life to being anti, anti-war and anti-sanctions and anti-violence. But I will tell you that I am totally convinced that these refugees are going to come into the United States and they are already creating a lot of, they're, they're bringing their fury with them and their fury has a cause. And to me, it's like a bar fight. In a bar fight, you have to keep these two groups separate. 
You don't, it doesn't matter anymore that we're right, we're wrong and they're right. Because what they want to do to get revenge on us is really scary. And we cannot let it happen or we're going to have a lot more wars. And you, what you see is the Operation Gladio and False Flag, and they're capable of doing false flags, just like we are. The Israelis are capable of doing false flags. If you have somebody you want to attack, like if you're Saudi and you want the United States to attack Iran, you have a false flag attack, and you set it up to make it look like Iran did it. And then you can draw the United States, because we don't think... 30 seconds ahead, and we got all these snowflakes are out there saying, war, war, give me war, you know, and you can make, you can push them to do anything. And I'm really, I, I want to say that. You guys, wake up. You are being severely manipulated. And if this show teaches you anything, you could have peace just as easily as you could have war. And this whole Russia scam is really frightening. There is no threat from Russia. Russia wants to be our ally. They are a powerhouse like we are. And we are now a, if anything, our stature has fallen so much in the world. We are no longer, we are, we are no longer first among equals. We are three, we're like a three headed triumvirate of superpowers, China, Russia, US. But mm-hmm. we're not leading them anymore. Right. Now, do you, think that's, do you think that's mostly because of the financial situation that the United States is in? Or do you think that's due to something else? What do you know? So? Yes, I, I think that I think that it is the financial situation. We have lost our moral authority. The world sees that now that we are hysterical and and really pretty crazy in our bloodlust. Like, and, and the insanity of attacking Syria and then saying, but we love the Syrian refugees. You're welcome to come live in our country. We're going to bomb your neighborhood. We're going to blow up your schools, your houses, your shopping centers. We're going to bomb your markets. We're going to kill your children. Come live in America. I want you to be my neighbor. I'm a really good person. I want you to live right next door to me, and I'm going to kill your children while you're there. It's crazy what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. We're going to yeah. kill you over there and we're, but we're really good people. You can, I love Islam. We don't want a Muslim bad. That would be racist. No, war is racism. Get it through your heads. War yeah. is racism. There's nothing worse than that. You're targeting an entire people for extermination. That is racism. And this I, I whole. I want to get back to the, uh, you know, the assets. And, and I just kind of want to make a point here as sort of an aside. You know, whenever like a, a rock star or a pop idol or something like that dies or commits suicide, you have a lot of copycat people, you know, that all of a sudden they can't live without this pop idol that they, you know, that they grew up with. And, you know, and so you have this rash of suicides that kind of uh, are in sympathy with these. And so I, I think terrorism is... Is a lot the same way. Like this guy who allegedly did the Manchester bombing, uh, you know, was not a, an import. He was a domestic, you know, and, and yet was this kind no, of. No, he has, he has very strong ties to Libya. His brother does. was arrested in Libya. And, okay, and I would like to talk about Libya because, uh, you know, when Gaddafi came to power in Libya, it was one of the, the poorest countries in Africa. And, and by the time we, we came, we saw he died. Uh, you know, he, he, Libya was one of the richest, you know, countries. And you talked about how they had, you know, built up this gold reserve, had a great oil infrastructure where they could sell oil for a dollar. Uh, a barrel and uh, or get it out of the ground for a dollar a barrel and, and so uh in in they call it was, sweet crude sweet crude and he was sharing the wealth with his people i mean he was uh and he was not i mean he was very good for the female the the women in uh in libya you know uh, is you know they were not treated like cattle or, you know, property to be, you know, traded and sold by their husbands and fathers and that. They actually had a say in their future. And, uh, 
I, I think Gaddafi even had an all female, uh, you know, team of bodyguards or something like that trained to uh, protect him. Is, you know, can you want to talk about, did you know? Yeah. Did you those know? are, those oh. are very good. Those are very good. Uh, when, when Gaddafi took over, there was, there was universal poverty and I- illiteracy was, it was sky high. By the time of his death, 89% of Libyans were literate. He had free education, free health care, free housing. Uh, there was a marriage bonus of $50,000. And per child, each couple got $5,000, which caused a, a boost in the population, the young population. And he agreed to pay for their university education. Women could travel outside the country with a guardian and everybody's expenses, housing, tuition, etc., food for, for the woman and the guardian would be paid for. And uh, because women still, there's, but women did not wear the hijab. Women drove cars. Women had, there were more professional doctors, medical doctors in women, women medical doctors than there were men in Libya. And all of the wealth was shared amongst the people. Now, the young people, here's the tragedy. The young Libyan men who, they had, they had this high, very high birth rate, got bored, and they started hearing this Islamic jihadist philosophy, and they got, oh, I'm going to have a jihad. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. And they destroyed Libya. The families now are so bitterly disappointed bitterly enraged because these kids these stupid kids um who were very very spoiled they had never worked for anything in their lives and they had everything given to them and now they were tearing the society they have torn the society apart and even the the young jihadists um the families feel that their sons are very are great disappointments to them great disappointments and they all say you know i hear from these libyans all the time saying oh if only we could go back and bring back Gaddafi." we are so sorry that we did not appreciate how great it was what we had was so good and now we have lost everything we have lost everything and you know libya is a failed state now yeah now do you also kind of like a bulkhead to keep all of that mass, uh, you know, migration of immigrants out of Africa into Europe. Uh, that was kind of like a buffer zone. He managed to keep them at bay. So that, uh, you know, that's part of the problem too, is that, uh, they're no longer there as a, as a, you know, as a, a border, a boundary or whatever. Well, what's happening now, it's even worse than that. After the uh, fall of Gaddafi, all that now realize this is done by Obama and Hillary. Before the fall of, of Gaddafi, the Islamic radicals would, with big eyes, swore to Hillary Clinton, we're not going to hurt women's rights. Oh, no. Women will have protected rights. And the very, the very first day, the first hour, the very first action that they took was to make an announcement. And they are very proud of this. And they, they said, we want you to know that our first commitment is to, is to Islam. And therefore, we are renouncing women's rights in marriage. Henceforth, women will no longer have the rights to decide marriage and have, handle property. Women will no longer have rights in divorce. Women, women who hold a job will have to give their money to their husband. They will have no money of their own. They will have no control over their children. If a woman leaves her husband, she will lose her children forever. That was the very first lie that they, the very first promise they broke to Hillary Clinton. The first promise they broke to Barack Obama was just as ugly. They had promised, oh, there are all those migrants from Africa living in Libya. They'll be safe. We're such a modern society. Well, let me tell you what really happened. They began hunting out all the black Africans who were there as migrant workers because Gaddafi had a lot of money. And Libya has a history going back a 
several hundred years of slave trading. They're huge slave traders. And so Gaddafi had made peace with Africa and sort of apologized for Libya's very dirty past. Well, what they, once he was dead, they went through and killed every, every black African they could find. They, the, the, the jihadists did. They hunted them on the street. People were hiding. Anybody who was hiding a, a black African, um, was killed. Uh, they could, if they were in somebody's car, not only would they drag the black African out of the car, they'd take the driver out and they'd just shoot everybody. So they scared everybody to throw their, to condemn their neighbors and to, you know, there's one of them right there, you know, oh, he's hiding in the backyard. And they put these people in alleyways and yards. So they were literally hiding in people's backyards so that they could say, well, you're not in my house. Just hide in the bushes there. Well, try to remember this is 120 degrees. There's got no food, no water, no air conditioning, no electricity. It's murderously hot, among other things, among every other problem they've got. Now they've got no electricity because the electricity is going out. You know, it's only running six hours a day. And, you know, the blacks are being hunted That was the thing first. Now the blacks are being treated as slaves. And all the migrants, and and for all of us who hate the refugee problem, and all the, (laughs) the Libyans are are very um, entrepreneurial, let's put it that way. They're entrepreneurial, and they're rounding these people up now, and they're selling them in slave markets in Libya, all over Libya. They're, who's, they're, buying them, Susan? who's buying them? Um, families, just families who who want us, who want a free labor. You okay. don't have to feed them you very much. You don't have to give them anything very much. You don't have to pay them anything at all. But these are these are people who are trying to get to Europe, and so they're becoming the 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 the, the families who have who used to have money to pay. For whatever they wanted, they don't have any money anymore. They hate the blacks. Now, they blame the blacks for the fall of Gaddafi. There's this finger pointing. Why is Gaddafi gone? You. You, right. you, you. Right, right. You know, and so they're, and, and for a few bucks, you can grab a slave and work him to death until you want to shoot him. Women can be raped, and, and, and they are, the women, fem- the female slaves are sold as prostitutes. Uh-huh. It's really ugly. It's just- okay. So bringing this back to what just happened, what you what you just talked about is stuff that people that would be at that women's march worldwide would have been opposed to. In America, it became some sort of Trump anti-Trump rally. But I think the women's march worldwide was really opposed to the things you just um, ticked off about the stuff that just happened in, in Libya and after Qaddafi. Well, 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 well. My uh, Arab women friends are furious. They're so bitterly disappointed that the Islamic, that the the women's march got convo- convoluted, conflated, yeah, got sorry, conflated, conflated yeah. with the uh, the refugee ban. And people were like, we love the Muslims. We don't want anybody to hurt the Muslims. And they're like, uh, actually, you should be very concerned. If you care about Arab women, you should be very concerned about how women, Arab women are being treated. Right. And Islam is brutal to women, forced into marriage when they're 11 years old or 9 years old and beaten by their husbands if they, for any reason at all. Uh, sub, subservient violence and, and they have to bear children and if they don't bear the right children they get acid thrown on them if they talk back, if they're not complacent and, and so they're just severely beaten people. It is awful. They cut them up, they throw acid on them, they set them on fire. It's just, it's, it's, they, they cut off their noses or their ears. That's a big one, cutting off their ears. Because they're not listening to their husband, so they mm-hmm. cut off their ears. They cut off their nose. 
You know, okay. it's so, just so, so Gaddafi up. was more of a Western leader and it seemed like things were going okay until we put, we pulled him out and created this, this chaos thing that once again, the defense industry is the industry that, that benefits. Just like after 9-11, that created a situation where the defense industry is benefiting. When you said yourself, peace was starting to blossom all over the place. And that could have been a problem for this huge, massive amounts of money that was being moved through our a whole economy. Exactly. Peace was a threat. Peace was a threat. They needed a wartime economy, and there's talk that Hillary Clinton helped to steal some of the gold. Libya had a huge gold reserves that have all disappeared. It's all gone now. Huge one, gold reserves. One of the uh, things that you brought up that is a term that they use at the higher levels is called actionable intelligence. How can we use that? You know, how can we uh, take that idea and we, you know, I, I'm starting to call us the the other one percent because the people that are listening to this show and the people that are getting, you know, into this information now, you know, you go out and you try to tell your friends, your family, uh, talk to other people, and they're all, you know, well, what's Chicken Little got to say today? You know, is the sky still falling? Oh, no, no, no. I I, I, I tell you. Intelligence and, and spread it, you know, so that it gets out and it gets wings. And, and more and more people get into and start to understand, you know, what we can do by knowledge is power. So they use it at the top as power. How can we use it here at the bottom, at the roots as power? Well, I, here, here let, let, me, let, me, let me contradict you a little bit. I used to feel that way way too about what you just said that we were completely marginalized we were very much marginalized and president trump has changed all of that now the corporate media is savagely attacking him and we have got to do more to protect him and defend him and i am fighting bitterly uh to uh, i just i i got on the phone today and i called every member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Democrat and Republican. And I called every Republican on the House Intelligence Committee talking about Comey. And, or not Comey, sorry, uh, uh, CIA Director Brennan's statement yesterday to the House Intelligence Committee. I said, you have got this backwards. The CIA Director Brennan had said that Trump's associates can't, during the campaign were cavorting around with some Russian spies. And I busted them all right there. I called every single office and I said, that is factually impossible because um, um, ordinary citizens would never be able to identify who is a spy and who is not. That is the nature of espionage. Those details are never revealed. All of it is concealed. So if there was contact, the Trump people would never have known who they were dealing with at all. However, if Clapper and Brennan, had, CIA Director Brennan or Comey had known, had suspected these people were spies and saw that they were interacting with Trump, and they and they knew it because they were tracking these people's phones and their their. They're just monitoring. They're watching all the different inter- engagements they've got going on. Okay, so if if Co- if Clapper thought that or Brennan thought that, then they had an obligation to warn Trump, and that doesn't happen. That becomes an intelligence failure. That is not a campaign failure. That is not a crime by Trump. That's oh, a failure man. of the intelligence community. All right, Susan, we got to start heading out here. Um, I want people to know where they can get in touch with you. I know you've written a book that I want people to pick up. My Which, book is Extreme Prejudice. Right. And, and you can get it on Amazon. All right. And you have a website? No, not anymore, no. Okay. Right Thanks, on, Susan. Susan. Thank you. You rock. Thank you very much for sharing all that with us. Thank you.